I sat uh, two rows behind Morrissey at a gig at the Bridgewater Hall to watch Nancy Sinatra, of all people. And then um, somebody came walking across with a camera to get a selfie, and he just said, keep walking. Well, <laughs> my friend Steve, who should have been with me tonight, has actually got a better story than that. He actually once met Mark Morrissey in a supermarket when he was at uh, the peak of his fame in the Smiths. And he said, can I take a photograph with you? At which point he grabbed Steve's phone and said, I'll just take one of you and gave it back to him. So he's got a photograph of himself taken by Morrissey. <laughs> no, no way of proving that yet. <laughs> so eventually we got rid of Thatcher. Uh, ben Elton, the left-wing comedian, said that uh, punk rock and alternative comedy finally managed to get rid of Margaret Thatcher. And it only took 13 years. <laughs> 17 years. <laughs> so, and remember how Thatcher went? She was actually stabbed in the back by her own party. You know, the, the men in grey suits in smoke-filled rooms. And I'll be honest, I was really keen to get rid of Thatcher, but not like that. Not stabbed in the back by her own friends. I had my heart set on assassination, if I'm really honest. <laughs> <laughs> but does it make a difference? Billy Bragg, uh, to quote him again, once said, mixing pop and politics. He asked me what the use is. I offer him embarrassment and my usual excuses. And the specials were getting a bit frustrated with the way things were going. There were musical differences starting to come in. Linville Golding, who brought Sky into the band, now decided it was old man music. Silverton Hutchison got fed up and decided to leave, and he was replaced on the drums by a guy called John Bradbury. Limerick number four, John Bradbury. A fabulous musician called Bradbury. His drumming was sweeter than Cadbury's. That's as far as I got with that one. <laughs> Apparently you need two extra rhymes. So the, um, the album finally came out in 1979, the first specials album, and it was called The Specials. They weren't particularly good at album titles, if I'm really honest. <laughs> but they brought in a guy on trombone called Rico Rodriguez, who played with Dandy Livingston in Jamaica, a guy called Dick Cuthel on cornet, and uh, there was a tin tray played on nightclub by the producer, Elvis Costello, OBE. <laughs> Chrissy Hine of The Pretenders sang back backing vocals. Mick Jagger had heard a lot of stuff about them, so he came to watch a live gig. He walked out halfway through the song Little Bitch and said it was a brown sugar rip-off. But Jerry Dammers created the two-tone label. And what was so important about two-tone, it's the black and white, and it's the iconography of that. There were a few, but there was black bands, there was white bands um, around that time. And there was one or two bands that had black and white people together. Phil Linnett of Thin Lizzy, uh, Ray Dorsey of uh, Mungo Jerry. But generally speaking, you had black, black bands and you had white bands. The ethos of Two Tone and the Specials and Jerry Dammers was to start uniting black and white people playing music together at a time when it had never been more important. And if you listen to the uh, lyrics on the debut album, uh, The Specials, you'll hear a song called Do The Dog, where they talk about master racial masturbation causes national front frustration. The song called Doesn't Make It All Right, where they sing just because you're a black boy, just because you're white, it doesn't mean you have to hate him, it doesn't mean you have to fight. Concrete Jungle talks about being chased by the National Front, the animals are after me. So it was clear what the philosophy and the ethos was of Two Tone. And the album was a great album, it's a mix of classic covers and a few originals. There's a song that it called Too Much Too Young, which is about 37 minutes long. It's basically the special's Bohemian Rhapsody. But they decided to release it as a single, but they released a live version of it that was only about two minutes long and it got to number one in the charts. And there's a lovely bit of music trivia, I love music trivia. Mick Middles, the journalist, might be able to help me out here. But uh, when it got to number one, it was a live recording of Too Much Too Young. And there'd only ever been one other live number one uh, in the UK charts since then. Any idea what it was? Oh. Couple of clues, it was a rock and roll legend from America, but it was a bit of a novelty song. Chuck Berry, My Ding-a-Ling. Very good, well done, yeah. It was My Ding-a-Ling by Chuck Berry. And a lovely piece of trivia here, is that those two number one records, the first two live records to get to number one, My ding a by Chuck Berry, Too Much Too Young by The Specials, were both recorded in the Coventry Locarno. <laughs> Except, when I went to the Two Tone Village and spoke to them about that and tried to show off my knowledge, he said, no, that's complete rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> the Scottish comedian Billy Connolly went to number one with a parody of D-I-V-O-R-C-E in between those two songs, so it, it wasn't two consecutive songs. But I'm not going to let the facts get in the way of a lovely bit of trivia. And uh, I still think it's fascinating that two of the few songs that got to number one were both recorded in the Coventry Locarno. And this is a poem called That's Where the Similarity Ends. Oh, how Chuck made us chuckle by gleaning double meaning from his dingling. He caused no offence, though, with his innuendo. No major shock by referencing his cock, forget it. What I mean is, his dingling was actually his penis, do you get it? <laughs> Eight years later, the language was straighter, out in the open where the truth belongs, with special songs for the prudes to take exception to contraception. Tell it like it is, where all the girls are slags and the beer tastes just like piss, their words, not mine. Brutal honesty, cutting through the crap about teenage pregnancy, try wearing a cap. Eight years is a long time in musical politics. That's the generation gap. And then the second album came out. Now, you'll find this hard to believe, but I was actually quite cute when I was a baby. But when it came to my teenage years, 
I had long greasy hair, yes I really did have hair, slightly gingery, my face was covered in acne. My mum used to keep all those photographs in a book that she called that Difficult Second Album. <laughs> <laughs> and out came the specials Difficult Second Album. And um, the cracks were starting to show now, mainly because they were all being pulled in different directions and the album itself is a bit of a mishmash of different sounds. Neville Staple, who a couple of years ago had said that Scar was all man music, now wanted to go back to his Scar roots. Ronnie Radiation wanted to play Rockabilly. John Bradbury wanted to play Northern Soul. And Jerry Dammers got involved in a sort of weird mix of Scar and Muzak, which you can actually hear on some of the tracks on the album. In his biography, Hor um, Scar for Life, Horace Panther, the special bass player, said this. The debut album had a vibrancy and a positive anger. More specials seemed angry at its own impotence. It just didn't seem to care. And the specials no longer seemed to care. They stopped touring in 1981. They all got involved in various solo projects. We were wondering now what to do. Now we knew this was the end. But against all of that, suddenly out came Jerry Dam Jammer's absolute masterpiece. I'm sure you all know it. it was a song called Ghost Town. And Ghost Town came out at the peak of the race riots in the UK and really kind of reflected what was going on at that particular time. Do you remember the good old days before the ghost town? We danced and sang and the music played in any boom town. On the B side of that record was a song written by Neville Staple called Why? And it was actually a reflection on the fact that he'd been beaten up by Nazi, uh, National Front Nazi skinheads. And there's actually a line in it where he sings a Nazi salute and a steel toed boot. So there's too much fighting on the dance floor. At this point in the specials, there was also too much fighting in the dressing room. They recorded um, Ghost Town in Lamington Spa. To quote Joe Walsh, I had never been there, they tell me it's nice. But um, things were going badly. Limbaugh, Golding kept on complaining that all the brass was completely out of tune. Ruddy Radiation got so frustrated by the musical direction, he kicked a hole in the studio wall. We're okay here, aren't we? <laughs> and um, he nearly got kicked out of the studio. If they'd been kicked out of the studio when he did that, Ghost Town might never have existed. Just think about a world in which the song Ghost Town never existed. No, that's too dark a place, let's get out of there very quickly. And um, they all complained about a guy called Paul Heskett, who Jenny Dammers had brought in with his love of music, who played a flute solo on that song, or played a flute riff. Yes, that flute riff that if you know Ghost Town is now going through your head. But it was a massive number one hit, it was a massive number one in the UK, it was a hit all over, the, all over Europe, and it was number one single of the year in most of the music press. So somehow there was a massive last hurrah uh, through the song Ghost Town. But it wasn't enough to keep the specials together. Things had gone too far in terms of the, the fight within the dressing room. Um, Limbaugh Golding once said, the specials was like a marriage, but we just never got counselling. So there was a series of splits. There was a few reunions. There was partial reunions, but Jerry Dammers never wanted a part of it. There were separate projects, such as the Fun Boy 3 and the Colour Field. They single-handedly managed to free Nelson Mandela. And there was a few semi-reunions. And did an album a couple of years ago, a really good album of cover versions called Protest Songs. But there will never again be any kind of special reunion that will really mean anything. Because roughly about this time last year, we very sadly lost, very, very prematurely, the lead singer, Mr Terry Hall. I'd like to thank Steve, who's not with me tonight, for providing me with a perfect T-shirt for the poem. I lost Shane McGowan the other day as well, which makes it even more sad. Mm -hmm. Also absolutely heartbroken every time I hear Kirsty McCall song, uh, singing that song. But this is the T-shirt that Steve bought me when he heard this poem. And the title of the, the words on the T-shirt are also the name of this poem. It's uh, especially for Terry Hall, and it's called Much Too Young. I'll leave you with this one. You left this world much too young. Now we listen and lament about the songs you sung. Oh no, 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 no more rude boy. You left this world much too young, but you left us with the music blending darkness with the fun, fun, fun. Ain't he a hero? Yes, he is. A bona fide legend of the music biz. You left this world much too young. Now we listen to the lyrics that rolled off your tongue. Please give me, please give me, please give me your legacy. Call him adored. Let's raise a toast now. He struck a mighty chord while we were bored in our ghost town. He didn't want to be rich. He didn't want to be famous. But in the end, he had no choice with that awesome voice. You left this world much too young, but remember you until kingdom come. You were gritty and pretty and pithy, but now your song is sung and your afterglow is a shade of blue. I guess you kind of sort of know we'll always be thinking of you. I guess you kind of sort of know we'll always be thinking of you. Rest in peace, Terry. Thank you very much for listening.